Hello. Hi, welcome. Hello there. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you all to Nicole. But before that, I want to say that this is the first uh, lecture series organized by PROS, Psychedelic Research Organization of Zurich. And we hope to have a lot more sessions and lectures coming, coming up. So it's really great to see such a, such a good turnout for the first event. Uh, so thank you very much for coming. Uh, now I want to introduce uh, our speaker today, uh, Nicole. Uh, Nicole did her bachelor's in psychology and biology right here in University of Zurich. And then she did her master's work at the psychiatric hospital, university hospital. Uh, currently, she is working as a journalist, but the talk she's going to give us today uh, will be uh, her speaking to us as a scientist. She'll talk about the work she, do, she did during the, her master's and a little bit more. She also recently presented her uh, research at ALPS conference. You'll he hear more about this conference in, uh, in her talk. So without further ado, Nicole, stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anish. So can you hear me well? Just want to make sure. OK, great. So I would like to start with a rhetorical question. Have you ever asked yourself, how can we find out what effects a substance has that is illicit and that may have really, really bad effects to the human? How can we research this? How can we find out? So this is what I will be talking about today. I will start with a few issues that we will encounter when we want to find out how, with the example of MDMA, can, how we can we find out what effects these substances have on the humans. And then I will also talk about a study that I was part of at the Psychiatric University Hospital in Zurich and where we researched the negative or positive effects, we'll see that MDMA can have, and at the end, we will have time for questions. So let's start with the drug itself. Of course, we need to do some definitions in the beginning. So MDMA and ecstasy are basically the same. When we talk about ecstasy, we usually refer to these very fancy, colorful pills that you can see on the slide. These have actually very recently been tested here in Switzerland. So these are Swiss ecstasy pills. And um, when we say MDMA, we usually mean like the main psychoactive substance that these pills do contain. MDMA is short for a very long term. I'm gonna try to say it out loud. <laughs> it's I think 3,4-methylene-dioxy-methamphetamine. But of course, I'm gonna refer to it as MDMA or ecstasy during this talk. So MDMA is very often called to be a party drug or a rave drug because we see that it's mainly consumed at the weekends. When we have wastewater analysis, also here in Switzerland, we see that MDMA is mainly consumed during the weekends. And therefore, we say that it's probably a party drug. People consume it at raves. Um, but actually, we saw during the pandemic that people continued to consume the drug. So therefore, we can say that people also consume it outside of the party context. Where it's also being used is in MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. Actually, very recently, last month, um, Nature Medicine has published a study on the effects of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for post-traumatic stress disorders. And there they could show that MDMA-assisted psychotherapy was better than only psychotherapy for PTSD. MDMA is a releaser of serotonin, of noradrenaline, and of dopamine. And although I'm here to do a talk for the Psychedelic Research Organization of Zurich, MDMA is not a classical psychedelic, but it's classified as an entactogen. And entactogen means producing a touching within. And that basically describes what the drug does to us. So it creates euphoria, it creates 
elevated um, extroversion, it creates increased social interactions and so on. What it can also create are hallucinations though. And this is why we say it is an intactogen with psychedelic properties. So I told you already, when we want to find out what the long-term effects of MDMA consumptions are, we will need to face a few issues. I listed some of them here. This is not a conclusive list at all, but I want to talk and lead you through a few of these issues that we will encounter when we want to assess the effects of chronic MDMA use. So first, unfortunately, the gold standard is unethical. So usually, if we want to do research on the long-term effects of a drug, what we would do is we would draw people from a population and we would randomly assign them to one of two groups. One group gets the compound, for example, MDMA, and the other group gets a placebo, right? But of course, if we expect that there will be bad effects and if we would want to have people who consume MDMA on a regular basis, so chronic MDMA consumption, so therefore we would need to give those people who are in the MDMA group like 50 pills and see what happens. Of course, this is unethical. We cannot do this, right? So therefore, we cannot really investigate the causal relationship in a randomized control trial. That's not possible. Where it is possible, of course, the whether it's ethical or not is debatable, but we can do it with animals. Might be a solution, but there we face another issue. Animals aren't humans. Of course, humans are animals, but we'll make a distinction when it comes to studying the effects of a drug to an organism. So in animal studies, what we see is axonal degeneration caused by MDMA. You can see this on the picture on the bottom. And what you see there is on the left side, we have a brain slice of a monkey that has been treated with MDMA. And on contrast, on the right side, you have a picture of a slice that has not been treated with MDMA. And what we see on the left side is neurotoxic effects of MDMA, so axonal degeneration due to MDMA. However, we cannot really compare this we cannot say when we find these effects in animals that they exist in humans as well. Why is that? I listed a few of the uh, reasons here on the slide. So first of all, we have different dosing in animal studies. Usually when we administer a drug or for the case of MDMA, when we administer MDMA to animals, we have different doses. Usually um, MDMA was administered way more frequently than humans do consume the drug. So Usually MDMA is consumed very rarely because I told you already MDMA is a serotonin releaser and you can, can imagine it like this, that you have like a little bucket in your brain that is filled with serotonin and when you take MDMA, the bucket gets spilled and it's all gone. And then the next day, if you take MDMA again, you won't have the same effects as the day before. So therefore usually people don't use MDMA very often, right? But in the animal studies, we had higher frequencies than humans would normally consume it. And we also had higher doses than humans would normally consume them. What also differs is the route of administration. So humans usually orally ingest MDMA while in animal studies, the drug was injected. And of course, um, for example, in monkeys or also rodents, they have another metabolism than humans do. So maybe it's not our favorable option, but it's the solution that's left. We want to do a cross-sectional study. So what we would do is we would search for people who consume a lot of MDMA and we would try to compare them to people who don't. And then we can see when these, groups, when these two groups differ, what might be the effects of MDMA. But then again, we come back to our list of the issues. We have the use of other drug. So let me break this down. You have a very extensive table on this slide and I promise you, I'm only gonna show you two tables tonight and we also don't have to walk through all of these numbers, but I'd like to explain to you some of them. 
This is a table that's actually from the study that I will be talking later about. And it shows that people who consume MDMA very often consume other substances as well. So for example, for the case of cannabis, we have in the second column, the control group. And here you can see that nine people in the control group did consume cannabis, 30 didn't. While in the MDMA group, we had 23 people who consumed cannabis and 16 who haven't during the past six months, like in the six months before testing. When it comes to other substances like amphetamine though, of course, this had to do with the sampling as well, like people who joined the control group were allowed to consume cannabis while they weren't allowed to consume amphetamines. And there we can see, so people in the control group, none of them have consumed amphetamines, but for the MDMA group, we have 21 people who consumed amphetamines. The list goes on and on. You can see here that the page would continue. I won't show you all of the numbers, but there was cocaine on the list, there was ketamine on the list, nicotine, alcohol, and these were substances that the groups differed in. That is a problem if we have a cross-sectional study because of course when you have one group that consumes a lot of MDMA but also a lot of amphetamines and a lot of cocaine and the other group doesn't consume any substances at all, then in the end if you find a group difference you won't know why those group differences arose, right? You won't know where these group differences come from. So what you would want to do is find chronic MDMA users, MDMA users that use a lot of MDMA, and of whom MDMA is the favorable drug. This is also a little bit complicated, and um, what you would want to do, of course, is assess substance use to find out. In our study, we did this with three instruments. Um, the first one was a self-report instrument so we would very extensively ask people about their substance use. And that means we would ask them, when did you start drinking alcohol? Okay, with 16 years old maybe. So how much did you drink back then? Okay, two beers a week. So did your drinking behavior change in the years? And so on and so on. And we would do this for all the psychoactive substances out there. Takes a lot of time, very important though. What we also did is, when you have a self-report um, instrument, like an interview, of course people could just lie. I mean, people are being paid for participating in the study and you cannot really tell whether what they say is what they really did. So what we would do is we would take hair samples as well. And with those hair samples, we could validate what they indicated in the interview. That was also very important. And the third solution that we had was also urine testing. And that was because when you have people who consume a lot of MDMA, but maybe also consume a lot of amphetamines, they may also use amphetamine in the days prior to testing, which would of course conflict the results. So if you have someone taking a drug before coming to testing, they might perform in the tests differently than they would without the drug. And we indeed had it that people came there and we did a urine test and they screened positive on some drugs and we had to exclude them due to those reasons. If we got this issue solved as well, <laughs> then we come to the last issue. How do we find chronic MDMA users? And we're talking about people who have consumed MDMA 40, 50 or more times in their lives. Does someone of you have an idea or how would you approach this? I'd love to hear your ideas. Yeah? Sorry? Parties, very good idea. Any other ideas? Yeah? Rehabs is a great idea for many substances indeed. For MDMA, as it's not, like I, I need to be very careful with my words here. Um, there are people who consume it regularly, but usually people don't get addicted on MDMA. So for MDMA specifically, my work, but probably 
in rehab, you will have people who have other substances that they prefer. Yeah? Very good idea. Drug test stations? Yeah? Oh yeah? <laughs> Never heard of this before. <laughs> but very interesting idea. I thought you were going for the control group, but it turned out way better. <laughs> yeah, please? <laughs> I'll keep that in my mind. <laughs> yeah, please? It gets better and better. I mean, if you know drug dealers, um, we may need to talk about ethical issues there as well, but if you know drug dealers and you won't find them in any other way, why not? <laughs> Are there any other ideas in the room? Okay. In this case, I will tell you what we did. And we started by creating a flyer and also a video. I will show the material to you so you can get an idea of what we did. Um, this was our flyer, and you can see where I was going with, <laughs> where I was going to with the design. Um, maybe you can recognize the picture on the right, it's actually the background of my slides. And yeah, the goal of this flyer was of course to attract people who are interested in MDMA or ecstasy. And you can also see a few of informations on the flyer that are interesting for the presentation maybe. So we were looking for people aged between 18 and 45 years old because with older people you may have age effects that you don't want. And we were looking for people of course that do MDMA or ecstasy regularly. And people were paid between 200 and 230 Swiss francs for their participation. What we also did was a video that was around four minutes long, where we would explain the study. And that was very important to gain trust because what I did a lot was post in Facebook groups that were dedicated to illegal raves and parties. And very often when I posted the flyer in there, people thought I was from the police. I was <laughs> not. <laughs> but um, that's why we did the video too. And that was really, really helpful because people could get to know us. They could see the rooms where the study happened. And um, yeah, I said, very helpful. So we had the flyer, we had the video, and then we started to distribute it. And actually I got a very nice idea from, from you that we could distribute these materials at drug information centers. And we actually did that at the drug information center here in Zurich, the DITS, where you can test your drugs. They helped us a lot with, recru with recruiting and um, same with Facebook groups. And what we also did was paid advertisement on social media. And then <coughs> when we reached those people, when we reached the people that we wanted in our sample, what we had to do, and it sounds like an easy step, but it was not, I can tell you, were the telephone screenings. So the telephone screenings were there to make sure that those people who were interested in participating in the study were also suitable, really. And those who were finally suitable made it into the study. So now we got all our issues, issues solved. And this is why I would like to continue with the second part, the study that I promised you that I was going to be talking about that we performed at the Psychiatric University Hospital here in Zurich. I told you two tables tonight, this is the second one, um, and it gives you a nice overview over the study that we did. So in the final sample, we had 39 controls and 39 chronic MDMA users, and as we could not randomly assign them, we had to do matching between those groups. So what we did was when we had controls who were interested in participating in the study, we would make sure that they match one person in the MDMA group. And you can see the result of this. 
the two groups didn't differ in their age, they didn't differ in their sex, they didn't differ in their years of school education, and luckily they also didn't differ in their verbal in intelligence. Where they, they differed, of course, was their MDMA consumption. And one number that may be interesting and that may show very beautifully how the two groups differed is this one. It's the cumulative dose of MDMA that people in the MDMA and control group have used during their lifetime. So you see in the control group, we had maybe one, maybe a few people who had consumed MDMA but compared to those in the MDMA group, it was nothing. Because in the MDMA group, we have a median of 633 tablets per person, which is a lot. And you see the standard deviation below that is over a thousand. So there was also a lot of deviation in the sample. People who we have invited to participate in the experiment had to undergo around nine hours of assessments. There was quite of an extensive list of experiments that we did with those people. We did a clinical assessment that was of course important because we wanted to make sure that people didn't suffer from any diseases that might confound the results. So we did screen them for psychiatric disorders, for ADHD, for depression. We also assessed verbal IQ. We assessed verbal learning. We assessed, I already talked about this, substance use history very thoroughly. We took hair and urine samples. We did perform an MRI. And you can actually see the actual MRI device that we used um, on the slide at the Psychiatric University Hospital here in Zurich. We did EEG and we did a lot of more, but these are the things that we're gonna need tonight. Not quite the results, but parts of them, of course, when you have such a sample, such a beautiful sample of people that had consumed so much MDMA, when you put years of work into recruiting them, into finding them, into screening them, then you won't just publish one study on this, but you would do multiple of them. These are the ones that are out already, um, but I will be talking about the yellow one because this is the one that I wrote my master thesis about and that I co-authored as well. So please do not ask me any questions on the other studies in the end. Thank you. Um, the goal of this study that I will be talking about in the next 20, 30 minutes had the goal to investigate whether MDMA is neurotoxic to humans. That was the expectation or fear because we had a few studies showing that there were molecular alterations in the human serotonin system of people that consumed MDMA. We also saw that people who use MDMA regularly have neurocognitive deficits means they had deficits in learning, deficits in memory, and also deficits in executive functioning. So we thought there is something going on and maybe these neurocognitive deficits are actually related to molecular alterations. And I already told you this, in animal studies, we actually saw axonal degeneration. However, you probably remember that picture of the brain slices of the monkey where we could show that there is axonal degeneration after MDMA administration. Of course, when it comes to humans, we have to investigate the effects of MDMA in the living organism. So this leads us to the next question, how do we do this? This slide gets a little bit technical, but I promise you all of you will understand what we did. The method that we used is called DTI, that is short for diffusion tender imaging. And diffusion tender imaging can be performed with a regular MRI user, uh, MRI scanner. You've probably seen them before, or maybe you have been in one of them before when you participated in a study or when you were injured. DTI, what it does is it measures the movements of water molecules. 
And you can see this very well on the picture on the slide. If water molecules aren't constrained, they would just move randomly in every direction. However, within axons, so those parts in your brain, the nerve fibers that connect your brain regions, these are very, very tiny, very, very thin. And therefore, water molecules are constrained in their movements. And that's what DTI measures, the movement of water molecules. And from that movement, we can infer the direction of these accents. And the measure that we have for this is called fractional anisotropy, short FA, and it is a measure of white matter integrity in the brain. Let's keep in mind that it's sometimes a little bit hard to interpret these measures, but I will get back to this later. Actually, before we did our study, there were a few studies that used DTI in MDMA users, and they did study white matter alterations in regular MDMA users. However, they delivered very conflicting results. So one of them, I think, showed elevated fractional anisotropy, so higher white matter integrity. One of them showed lower fractional anisotropy, and two of them didn't show any alterations at all. That might also be due to methodolo methodological constraints that these studies have. There is a list of problems that these studies had met on the methodological side and that we tried to minimize, of course, with our study. Our expectation, based on previous studies on neurocognitive deficits, on animal studies, we expected that we would find decreased fractional anisotropy in chronic MDMA users, so reduced white matter integrity, and we also expected that there will be a positive association between the reduction in fractional anisotropy and MDMA use intensity, so that people who used more MDMA would have less fractional anisotropy, so less white matter integrity. I would like to talk a little bit on the analysis that we did. And I'd like to start with this picture of the brain. Because this picture is actually what DTI looks like in the end. And it's the picture that's displayed on Wikipedia when you search for DTI there. But it's also the cover of a song I really like. And if you look closely, the album is called Connection. And that is, that is what it's all about, the DTI, because what we will investigate is the connection between brain regions, so nerve fibers. This is the analysis, and it gets a little technical here again. So what we would first do is what we call tractography. This is a process where we take these pictures of the water molecules, how they move in the brain, the direction, put them together, and then we will have a bro whole brain reconstruction of all the white matter tracts, all the nerve fiber, in a single participant. These are very colorful, and that has a reason. That is because these colors indicate the direction of the nerve fibers in the brain. So red is from left to right, and right to left. The blue is superior to inferior, and other direction, and green is anterior to posterior. So with these colors, you can see the direction of the nerve fibers in the brain. What we would then do in a second step is what we call bundle segmentation. So we would take this whole brain reconstruction and extract individual bundles for each participant. I think it were 48 bundles per brain, per participant. And then comes the final analysis, the bundle analytics. And there it gets interesting, because now for every participant in the MDMA group and for every participant in the control group, we will have these bundles. And we will take an average for the MDMA group. No, we won't take an average. But we will compare the group in each bundle in various segments. So we would take these bundles in the brain and make segments out of it and compare these segments between MDMA users and controls. 
And by comparing these, we will know whether there is a difference in white matter integrity between MDMA users and controls. And now we're there at the results. What we found was completely against our expectations. We didn't found any evidence of MDMA-induced neurotoxicity. What we found instead was increased fractional anisotropy in several white matter tracts in the brain. So when we compare these results to other substances, for example, ketamine or methamphetamine, there we would find reductions in fractional anisotropy, which we interpret as white matter reductions. However, in MDMA users, we found the opposite. And one possible explanation for this would be neuroplasticity. So if you know about other psychedelics, you may know that a very common theory is that psychedelics do induce neuroplasticity in the brain. And this study might hint into the direction that the same is the case for MDMA. You may remember our second hypothesis was that we would find that the more MDMA people consume, the less fractional anisotropy would they have. But what we found instead was a negative correlation between MDMA use intensity and fractional anisotropy in parts of the corpus callosum. You can see this on the slide. So the red part of the corpus callosum, that is the segment where we found the group difference. And it may sound a little weird. Those people who haven't consumed too much MDMA or less or moderate use intensity, they had higher fractional anisotropy values, and those who consumed more had lower. So is this good news only? Sounds great, right? Hmm. Unfortunately, it's not. We have, several, we have several problems when it comes to the interpretation of these results. Um, first of all, I first explained to you that if we want to have causal results, then we would need to do a randomized controlled trial, which we couldn't do. So it's a cross-sectional design, and what we see are correlational results and not causal results. What we also need to consider is that there may be lifestyle factors that differ between the MDMA group and the control group that we didn't take into consideration. So for example, if you have a person that goes to raves each weekend over years and years and years, then this person will have another lifestyle than a person who doesn't do this, right? And these are factors that we couldn't, like we could control for some of them, but unfortunately not for all of them. Then what we also have, and I teased this a little bit earlier, is that the interpretation of this measure that we use, the fractional anisotropy, is also limited. So this measure that I told you was gonna measure white matter integrity measures a lot of things. On the level of white matter, there is a lot of things going on and we cannot really tell what it means exactly. Is it the myelinization? Is it some other thing we cannot really tell. So we are really constrained in the interpretation of the results. There is another thing that's maybe not so good news. So you may remember that neurocognitive deficits are apparent in MDMA users. And with the same sample, we found this also again, um, especially in verbal memory. So with that, I'm almost at the end of my presentation. Of course, I would like to thank the team. This is the team of almost all the people that were involved in the study. You see, it takes a lot of time and effort and people to conduct such a very extensive study. Um, my main supervisor was Professor Boris Getno at the university, at the Psychiatric University Hospital, and Joshua Zimmermann was the PhD candidate back then, now he's a doctor, whom I worked with very closely, and many, many other people. So maybe now you're hooked, hopefully, <laughs> by the topic of psychoactive substances and pharmacopsychology. If you like to learn more, I can recommend you a podcast that I'm involved with. We have um, one episode on, it's in German, 
psychedelica in der Psychotherapie. And I think that Prost will talk about the Alps from a little bit later. All right, so I will skip this. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. It was great to have you all here. And now I'd like to answer your questions. Okay, thank you again, Nicole, for giving us this talk. Um, we'll be taking your questions now. You can just raise your hand and we'll come to you with a microphone. Um, I'm not sure about the study on the cognitive, well, I'm pretty sure that we did it, but I wasn't involved in those analysis, so I can only speak about this um, study, and there we did it. This was actually, you know, I told you about the methodological constraints the other studies had, and those didn't control for co-use, but we did. Of course, it's limited, again, to control, but we did in the analysis, yes. Exactly. Very good question. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot for the presentation. What does white matter integrity actually represent? For example, does it represent something to do with memory or cognitive impairment, or what does it like? It's like a very good morphological conclusion, but what does it represent in human nature, especially considering the fact that most of us here are psychology students. I mean, not me, but, <laughs> and you are also, I think you also did psychology major. And like, what does it mean in human context, not in biology? That is a very, very important question. Very good question. That is very hard to answer. Why matter integrity itself can mean a lot. It's very often interpreted as myelin sheet integrity. And myelin sheets, if I remember correctly, are related to the speed of, how you say this, how electric, elektrische Reizweiterleitung. <laughs> what it means for our everyday functioning I cannot tell you, unfortunately. Maybe if there's an expert on this on the room, I'd love to hear any inputs, but um, when I did my master thesis, I struggled with this question a lot because, of course, I wanted, like, my dream was to have these biological results and from that be able to say, yeah, this means this and this and this and that. But you can't really. We're not there yet. Exactly. Sorry, I didn't understand the last part. I think it's very difficult to show a cognitive deficit from a motor disorder uh, from a motor disorder point of view. Because it's very difficult. No, we didn't. Um, like when I said we still find neurocognitive um, neurocognitive effects of MDMA or neurocognitive problems in MDMA users, or, well, not problems, but like decreased verbal memory in MDMA users. I don't know whether it's connected to our results. It's just something that we need to keep in mind because <coughs> it looks great, right? We have this hypothesis, it's neurotoxic, and then we find the opposite from what we expected. Sounds great, but the picture is way more complex. Thank you. It 
it was very useful. I don't know how much I can go into detail here, but we had to exclude people from the sample because of the hair analysis, yes. I have a question over here to write. Ah, yeah, Hi. sorry. Um, I wanted to ask, how did you control the concentration of MDMA? Sort of, did you provide the subjects with the tablets, or because I mean, if some people have taken MDMA for a longer period of time, it will affect differently in a person who's only taken it like five times. Oh, you mean the number of? No, the concentration. The how concentration did you control per pill. that? Yes. And did you test it again after? Like, how long did this take? Did you test it every month or every week for a c like a couple of months? I very don't know. Very good question and very important question. So we did, like, people who participated in the study were there only once. So it was a cross sectional study. We had them there and their MDMA consumption happened before they participated in the study. We didn't provide them with any substance. And you're very right, this is a very important question. Pills can differ a lot in how much MDMA they contain. We did ask people um, who we included in the study whether they know how much MDMA their pills did contain, but most of them couldn't really tell. Exactly. Anything is possible in the drug world. We, we don't know, we just took an average. Oh, uh, oh, sorry. On your fractional anisotropy result, you have somewhat of a Simpsons paradox style of correlation pattern. So you have a positive correlation across groups and then um, and negative correlation within the treatment group, so more consumption was, if I remember right, associated with lower FA. And I'm not sure whether I understood your question correct. Are you talking about the table? Uh, I, I the I'm talking about your remark that you, you had this contraintuitive result that fractional anisotropy was higher across in like within the treatment group compared to the control group, but then within the treatment group it was decreasing in the uh, frequency of consumption, right? Yeah, exactly. So do you mention that it's only correlational and then you proposed uh, the hypothesis for the um, between group difference as potentially um, neuroplasticity? Do you also have a hypothesis on what the pattern within the treatment group is? It's very hard to tell. Um, so. First, we need to remember that this effect was only found in one very specific brain region. And, you know, what do you do with this? Very hard to interpret. Um, very important question. We posed this ourselves too. And in the paper, we wrote that it might be similar to effects that were found with alcohol consumption. There, they also had this weird U shape of people who had like people who didn't drink, if I remember correctly, people who didn't drink much alcohol b and those who dr did drink a lot of alcohol had kind of the same pattern and those who had moderate drinking habits, they had a different pattern. So this seems to be a thing in other substances as well, but I cannot say why this is. What do you mean by selection? It's a very good hypothesis. I don't know, but it's a very good hypothesis. Could be. Thank you. Um, I don't know about ongoing studies on MDMA. Um, of course, it always depends on what you want to research. So the study that has been published last month in Nature was an RCT. There was a, a clinical phase three trial. 
um, because there the study was about the positive effects of the substance. It really depends on what you want to do. And I don't think there will ever be a study where you would just like spoil people with 50 pills of MDMA and see hmm, what happens. I don't think this will happen, but depending on the hypothesis, depending on what you want to research, there are trials going on. Thanks. Yeah. Not significant, so no di no difference. Yeah. Um, you said that the serotonin bucket, like when you take M MDMA, it like you spill it in your brain, kind of. And I was wondering how mu how much time it takes that it's filled up again, that you get the same high again. <laughs> Um, <laughs> <I'm not laughs> no, um, I mean, this question is debated a lot when you search for MDMA online because people want to know how long they should wait until they take the next dose. Um, I don't know the exact time it takes. What I do know is that it takes longer for women and that it depends. Like... Each person is different, and there is not like a number of so and so many days, and it's exactly the same for every person. So you mean how many people would have been possible to recruit? Two? Whether it's harmful for research? <laughs> um, so do I understand you correct that you're saying that if more people will consume the drug, then we would have more people to do the research on. No, I was saying that if you people, yeah. how, how much people Oh. Probably a lot. <laughs> I haven't done a study on that topic, unfortunately. But I think that it would have been way easier because, of course, these substances are stigmatized. And I told you that when we did advertising on social media, people thought that we were police trying to, you know, talk them into something or trying to catch them. And, of course, if that had not been the case, it would have been easier to reach people. And I think they would have, like, have had less hesitation to participate but how many people that would be if it was legal, I don't know. Thank you. Uh, sure. Very tough question. Very important question. Um, I think that's a question that bothers people today um, because we have this theory that psychedelics do induce neuroplasticity and that um, therapeutic effects do arise due to neuroplasticity. But again, in the living organism, we are constrained in the methods that we can use. And I was involved in a study that did investigate neuroplasticity um, after LSD. And what we would do there were two paradigms. One paradigm was with um, Magnetstimulation TMS. 
transcranial magnetic stimulation. And it gets very complicated there. What we would do is we would test the, like we would have an electrode here and we would have the device here and we would check how long it takes from the motor cortex to here and back the signal, how long it takes to tra travel. And then we would stimulate the motor cortex, we would stimulate this connection, and what we would check for is whether the connection between these two changes in another way when people are under the influence of LSD compared to when they are not. It's very complicated and again, still needs a lot of research to see whether it works. Um, but this is one possibility. But then of course you also like, we don't need how, uh, we don't know how long these neuroplasticity effects last if they are there. So in this LSD study, we had the people there, they, they got LSD and we could see it on the day in the, in the, like on the day where they got the LSD and in the days after that and in the weeks after that, but maybe these effects diminish after four weeks and then we don't know. Like, it's very hard to, to find such methods and people are on this. I'm not an expert in this, but um, it's an ongoing thing as far as I know. Yeah. So um, you said that the mean amount of pill that every participant had in their lifetime was over 600. So what was your reac reaction when you saw that number? I mean, like the mean, so that means like some people had probably double the amount of tests. Like it is, seems like a high number or was it like, no, that's plausible? Or what was your reaction? Um, so I've been working in the nightlife before I started studying the effects of some aspects of the nightlife. So I was kind of, you know, I, I knew that people are doing this. So uh, for me, it was not, not like, whoa, what the fuck? Like well, what, what you would still need to take one pill each week for like 10 years. What we do have are people who seem to be not very sensitive to the drug and they can do 10 pills in a night. Oh. It happens. Mm. Like, I'm not saying that you should do this. <laughs> feel like, like on the reactions, I need to say this as well, but there are people who seem to be not very, very sensitive. People are very different. Okay, we can take one final question. I'm sure Nicole will stick around afterwards and they're up here, and then you'll be able to interact with her, and otherwise she also has an email address. I'm sure you can send her an email. She probably will respond. Okay, so we'll take one final question. Um, He's the closest to the microphone. Then, uh, but then you need to take the microphone, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I know this is basically an impossible question to answer, but <laughs> have you considered like how, um, um, like when you began the study, was it a consideration that you made that since pills are made illegally, they, I mean, obviously they are not pure MDMA, there's a bunch of fillers and unregulated stuff in that. It, would it be possible that some of the detrimental effects are due to the fillers and not the MDMA itself? So with fillers, you mean substances that are in the pill that aren't MDMA? Yes, exactly. Um, so as far as I know, this could have been, ch uh, I don't know if this changed, but back when we did the study, MDMA pills were rather pure. And as we, included people who consumed a lot of them, there was a high chance that their main substance that they consumed was indeed MDMA. Um, but yeah, of course we cannot tell. It's the same as with the dosage. Like, people usually don't know exactly what's in there if they don't test their drugs. Thank you. Okay, with that we conclude our talk and also our question round. Um, give a final round of applause for Nicole for taking the time. <laughs>